Cone Creative Adventurers. I'm Debbie Cone with D Cone Designs. I'm so glad you're here today. Are you like me and have decided to do a block of the month quilt this year? I have. I'm going to do the aquiltinglife.com's block of the month. For this month, their block is a sawtooth star. I'd like to show you how to make a sawtooth star and give you a few tips and tricks along the way. A couple of quick notes before we get started. This video is not sponsored or affiliated in any way with aquiltinglife.com, but please do check out Sherry's aquiltinglife.com video and blog post. There you'll find all the information about her block of the month for 2022. The downloads and patterns are free, and please be sure you view her video and her blog post for wonderful tips and tricks on how to make this wonderful block. Please give this video a big thumbs up. Leave me a comment and tell me what block of the month or block of the week quilt you want to work on this year. And then go ahead and tell a friend and go on over to my blog at decondesigns.com and follow along there as well. Just a quick note for those who are interested, up on my design wall behind me, I have the backing for a wall hanging that I did. I actually tried to make it reversible, use up some extra pieces and give it a modern twist. So that's what's behind me. Before I get into how to construct the sawtooth star, I want to talk a little bit about the fabric I chose for the Quilting Life block of the month for 2022. As you'll see, if you check out Sherry's website at aquiltinglife.com, if you look at the fabric requirements and the information she gives, she lets you know that all of the blocks will be your choice of six inch or 12 inch. She also lets you know that um, all of the blocks will have a churn dash border around each block. And you can see my cat in the background there. That's Mama Kitty. Go Mama Kitty, out of the way. Go on. No, take your tail too. There we go. No, no, no. Go on. Okay, so fabric choice. She recommends 12 to 18 fabric, uh, 12 to 18 fat quarters. And here I've chosen 15 fat quarters. These are fat quarter bundles I got from my local big box store. I just happened to see them and I like the really cute sloth. It's Christmas. Um, uh, sloth, you can see the really cute sloth in the cup of hot cocoa. There's a blue with a field of turquoise stars, some hearts that look like sloth tails, and then some Christmas trees and Christmas presents. I wasn't sure that would be enough fabric, so I also purchased a little bit additional at my local fabric store. Um, some green, sort of grungy looking, and then some trees, which I felt that will complement the others as well. It's almost identical, but it's not the same manufacturer. It just happens to go well. So I brought those in case I need them. That also evens out my colors a little bit more, because if you look at the fat quarter bundle, you've got two darks, this navy and this blue. You've got um, turquoise and the red for the mediums. And then this tree one is a little bit on the lighter side. And so I also have this lighter tree block or tree fabric. And then I've got the green grunge for a medium tone. I was also looking at color range. So I knew in the fat quarter bundle, I had one red, two blues, a turquoise, and then a multicolor. I wanted to bring out the green a little bit more, which is why I purchased this. And I knew I wanted a little bit lighter one as well to go with this one. So I think this will round out my fabrics. The next question was, do I want each of my churn dash borders to be the same or different? And looking at my fabrics, I'm thinking that I may end up making all or almost all of my churn dash borders this blue here. Uh, <clears throat> for one reason, it's going to bring out the turquoise of the blocks, which I think is interesting and unusual. And there wasn't really, I didn't want to use the red because I didn't feel it would go well. There wouldn't be enough contrast and I didn't care for the pattern as a churn dash strip uh, border. I think I'm going to use this for my churn dash strip border along with whites. And you'll want to go back to her video to learn how to make the churn dash border. Um, she uses a strip set method with uh, HSTs. She gives great instruction on that. So please go back and visit her video for that portion of the block. Today I'll be showing you the sawtooth star portion. I've covered my fabric choices. Let's go ahead and work on putting together the sawtooth star. Before we start sewing the sawtooth star, let's take a quick look at the anatomy of a sawtooth star. This star is known by many other names. Most likely know it as the sawtooth star. In this block, 
this section here is the sawtooth star. This is a part that joins another block, and this is for a different quilt. But I want to show it to you as the block is all constructed. So in the center, you have the center square of the star, and you can make that in contrasting fabric like I did on this one, or you can make it in a fussy cut fabric, which is what I will do for the quilt along, or you can make it solid like the points of the star as well. It's really up to you. I've even done a four patch in the middle of some of my sawtooth stars for other quilts. It's totally up to you. You can make this be however you want. You could even make the star points different colors or different fabrics, depending on how scrappy you want it. Maybe you want to use up a lot of scraps. You can certainly really scrap up this block. Okay, so you've got the center square. You've got one, two, three, four squares on the outside. And then you have these units here. These are the star points. They're called flying geese. You can see that the triangle pieces overlap or come together. Actually, the triangle pieces come together in the middle. And those are called the flying geese. This portion here would be the goose portion. And this portion they would call the sky. I think of it as the goose body and the goose wings. But it's totally up to you how you define it as long as that you're clear on which is which. The bigger triangle is always the goose in the flying geese block and then these would be the outer parts. This part of the tutorial will concentrate on how to make the flying geese units for the sawtooth star block. Okay, as you can see here, I've laid out the fabrics for my sawtooth star block for the A Quilting Life block of the month for January 2022. I've got uh, my fussy cut sloth with the cute little baby and the hanging sloth in the center for my star sawtooth star. And I've got my four outside squares and then I have my uh, geese and star points. I've decided to use red fabric for the star points. All I'm going to be showing you right now is how to do these sections here, the flying geese section. In the pattern, the free pattern on the aquiltinglife.com website, it calls for the stitch and flip method for flying geese. So that's the one I'm going to demonstrate now. For the stitch and flip method for making the flying geese, you'll need a pencil and you'll need a straight edge or a ruler. The first thing you'll want to do is to mark a straight line from corner to corner. And because you're doing eight altogether of the star points, I like to lay down at least two. Sometimes I'll even do four. And I line up my ruler at the point here, the point here, the point here, and the point here, making sure that I account for the width of the pencil. And then I draw a light pencil mark. I'll make it a little darker so you can see it down the center. This will become the line we're going to measure from. Okay, here we are at the sewing table. You can see I have my first square that I have drawn the line, diagonal line on, and I'm about to stitch it. My biggest tip that I can give you is to sew, when you sew on the diagonal line, you don't actually sew on the line. You want to sew just to the outside of the line. Let me point to what I mean. So right here, you're going to want to sew just maybe a thread or two to the outside. So along this side over here, the outside, this would be the inside of the block, the outside of the line. The reason for that is you're going to be cutting this excess section off over here, and then you're going to be flipping it back. After you stitch, you flip it back on the diagonal, and you'll want to make sure that the fabric goes all the way to the edge of where the block should be but the thread will stop it. So you need to have room for the fabric to fold over, not just to stitch on the line. So stitch just to the outside of it to give room for the fold in the fabric. That will help you have an accurate flying geese. I've stitched, as you can see, I've stitched just maybe one thread's width to the left, to the outside. Okay, now that we've stitched our square onto the end of our rectangle, we're going to clip it. We're just going to snip so we have eyeball a quarter inch seam. You could measure, you can use your rotary cutter. I'm just gonna snip it off with my scissors. The next thing we're going to do is take it to the iron and press this back, and then we'll sew on the other side. 
All right, now that we've sewn our first square onto the rectangle, we're going to set our seam. Just hold it there for a moment, give the threads a chance to relax, and then we're going to flip it back or fold it back, pull gently, just nudging the fabric over like that. And you can see it extends well to the edge of the rectangle and a little bit beyond. Don't worry about that. We will trim it up. We'll square it up in a little bit. Now it's time to sew the square onto the other side. Now we're back at the machine ready to sew on the other square. Another way to do this, instead of drawing a line diagonally across each square, is to use diagonal seam tape. This is diagonal seam tape on my machine. What you can do instead is um, put your square in the corner of the rectangle, make sure it's in the corner like that, and then you're going to make sure that you sew diagonally down that and you're going to use the seam tape to help you. But you want to make sure that you sew just to the outside of the diagonal. And the way to do that is position your corner, your top corner, just to the left of the red seam tape line. The corner is just to the left of your needle. And then down here, this point is just to the left of the tape line. That will ensure you're sewing just to the, the right side of the diagonal. That will leave room for the seam and then to flip to fold the fabric over. That will help you ensure an accurate block. Okay, so now we're going to do the same thing. Take the scissors or your rotary cutter, and then um, I'm going to eyeball a quarter inch seam. It doesn't have to be exact. <clears throat> and then we're going to take it to the ironing board, the pressing mat, and then press it back like that. And that will equal one flying geese. Let's go to the pressing mat. Here we are back at the pressing mat. I've sewn my second square onto the rectangle, and now I'm going to gently and carefully ease that fabric back. I give it a little shot of steam, pressing gently, and then it's done and we're ready to trim. What I would do though is wait until you do all of your flying geese and then trim them all at once. So batch do this. You're going to chain piece uh, sewing one triangle on on all of the, the rectangles then trim all of them and press all of one side, then feed your rectangles back through one more time, and sew the, other, the square onto the other side of the rectangle and press them all at once. And then you can go ahead and uh, square them up or trim them up to size all at once. Batching it will make it faster and easier for you. So let's go ahead and trim up this rectangle. When trimming up your flying geese, you're going to need a straight edge of some sort and your rotary cutter. You can use a specialty ruler. They do have them, flying geese rulers, and those would be great. But if you don't have one, then you can do it this way. In this case, the flying geese are two and a half by four and a half. So I've got a two and a half inch ruler here that I'm going to use uh, for the two and a half for the two and a half inch dimension. So I'm going to line up my ruler along the bottom of my block and centering it so that I make sure that if there's a sliver here and a sliver here, it's about equal like that, scooting it over. And then I'm going to carefully trim the slightest bit of excess. There's not a lot, but there's just a little bit. And then on the other side, like that. And then I'm going to check for the four and a half inch. <clears throat> I like to turn my geese this way, it's just a little easier. And I look at my mat, and one, two, three, four and a half would be right there. And if there's any, and then I line it up along the mat line here to make sure it's even. And if there's any overage, I look to make sure that it's equally over, kind of averaging the excess. You can see there's a little over here and a little bit beyond there. So I've got it averaged so they come out about the same. You do want them to be trimmed equally. Otherwise your flying geese will be distorted. So I'm lining up my ruler and I'm trimming the slight bit that there is there. And I'm going to flip it around because it makes it easier for me since I'm right-handed. Lining it up again like that. Making sure it's straight. Going to the two and a half inch mark or the four and a half inch mark, and then trimming the excess, just barely, there's not much. 
And there you have it, one flying geese all done. So repeat the process for your remaining flying geese. I'll come back in a moment when I have all my flying geese done and we'll assemble the block. I thought I'd give you a quick tip. What if you accidentally sewed both squares onto the rectangle at the same time and forgot to trim? Well, just in case you have, because I've, I've done that for sure, um, you can go ahead and trim the one side, the underside, the one that's underneath, and then you can take a seam ripper and rip this part back. Once you do that, you don't have to take the whole thing off, pull it back, and then you can iron this back like that, making sure it was the bottom one, and then you can go, go back through and stitch right here. Once it's stitched all the way down, go back and restitch all the way down, trim, and then press, and you won't have to undo the entire thing. Just a quick tip. So here I have my flying geese, my outside squares, and my cute little sloth. So I'm going to put it on a design board because that will help me carry it to the machine easily, and then I won't get uh, mixed up when I'm sewing them together. So your flying geese are at the top, the bottom, and the sides, and you'll put the colored part together forming the star points. So the star points should, uh, the, this part of the star points should touch your block, your center block, and then you fill in with your outside squares like this. There's one there, one there, and one there. It's gonna look so cute when it's all sewed together. So let's do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sew it in rows. You could sew it in columns, but I'm going to sew in rows. So I'm going to sew these two together, and then these two together this together and this together, this together and this together. Then I will sew the row, the first row to the middle row, and then the bottom row to the first two rows. And then I'll come back and show you the completed block. Here we are, I've stitched each row. So here's the top flying geese, the center section with the cute little sloth, and then our bottom flying geese. According to the pattern, you're going to want to press the seams this direction. For the top and bottom flying geese, you'll press so the seams go to the outside. For the center section, you'll want to press so the seams go toward the inside, toward the center of the block. And then again at the bottom, you'll press so the seams go toward the outside. So let's do that now. Gently, there's one, flip it around. There's the top one. Now I'm going to press toward the center. The way I'm doing that is I'm going to pull the block up, the center part up, and then gently ease it down like that. And then flip it around, hold the center of the block up, ease it down gently like that. Then I've pressed those seams toward the center. As you can see, out, in, and then the last one will be out, like this. And then this one, like that, very gently. Press that down like that. There we go. So, it'll be like this. And then the last thing we're going to do is sew the three rows together, a seam here and a seam here. I'm going to probably pin when I sew here at these corners and nest my seams. That means this seam is going this way and that one's going that way, so they can kind of notch together. You can kind of see, I can push one, the top one going this way and I can pull with my fingers so the other one goes that way, and they kind of notch together. And then I'll pin it there, I'll do the same here and pin on that side and then stitch. I'll do the same on the bottom. I'll do that now and then I'll come back with the finished block. Here you can see I've pinned my seams at each corner and in the center. Now I'm going to go ahead and stitch them. Right here I'm slowing down to show you that I'm careful right here to stitch just to the, this side, the right side of this intersection so that I don't lose my points in my flying geese. And I flip it around, and I sew the other side. Again, making sure when I stitch down 
down there to ensure that I sew, if I can, just to the outside of the intersection. And there's the block. All we need to do is to press it. So let's go to the mat. Here's our sawtooth star block. The last thing we need to do is to press the seams. You can see I've got a couple drips from my iron, but don't worry about that. So I flip it over, and the pressing directions for the completed sawtooth section are not in the pattern. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press my seams toward the middle, this one and this one toward the middle, toward the center of the block. My reasoning for that is even though there are intersections here, this really wants to lay flat right there. So I think this will make the flattest block by pressing my seams toward the center of the block. That's what I'm going to do. So what I'm going to do is set the seams first, lay it gently for a moment. Then I'm going to flip the block over holding the center and then gently ease it down, easing it down like that. Nice and flat. And do the same on the other side. Set my seam. Hold the block up by the center. Move this thread out of the way. There we go. Hold it up by the center and then gently ease it down. Like that. There you go, it's ironed and flat, so it's ready to add the churn dash borders. For the purposes of this video, I'm not going to show the churn dash borders. You'll want to look at uh, Sherry's video uh, for January 2022 block of the month, where she gives you directions and tips on how to make the churn dash border. One thing you'll want to do before you add your churn dash border to the block is to square up the block. I'm doing the 12 and a half size, I'm doing the 12 and a half inch unfinished size. So the sawtooth star section of the block is actually eight and a half by eight and a half. You can use the ruler, which is what I'm using. I have an eight and a half by eight and a half ruler, or you could just lay it on your mat like this and then center it eight and a half, um, making sure if you have extra that it's equally on each side, trim those sides, rotate it, and then do the same on the other side. For convenience, I'm gonna use my ruler and so I'm laying my eight and a half by eight and a half ruler down, getting the excess equally on all sides. First, I look at side to side like that, and then top and bottom. I'm lining up my lines with my seams there and uh, along there as well. So it's centered and then looking for excess around the edges, holding it down carefully and thoroughly and then trimming. If you have a rotating mat, that's really helpful. Double checking and then trim the other side as well. Notice I'm holding it not flat, but I'm holding it like this so I can apply pressure equally across the entire ruler. The last thing I'm gonna do is trim the bottom. And there you are. It's all ready for the churn dash border. So all you'll want to do is add your churn dash border to all four sides and your block will be complete. And there it is. My January 2022 A Quilting Life Mystery Block of the Month. Be sure to check out A Quilting Life Block of the Month for January 2022, both Sherry's video and her website. I hope you enjoyed this and I will see you next month when we tackle block number two, February's 2022 block of the month for our quilting life. I can't wait for next month to sew up the next block. It's going to be cute and exciting. Thank you for joining me today. Please check back next week. I'll have more wonderful videos and tips and tricks for you. Be sure to check my YouTube channel for an upcoming video on a jelly roll race with a modern twist and a video coming up on the Bauhaus Zen Chic Quilt Along, which will be a weekly quilt along which begins in early February. So be sure to check out Zen Chic's Bauhaus Quilt on zenchic.com. 
If you like this video, please give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please tell a friend and also head on over to my blog at decondesigns.com where you'll find a free pattern in my shop with more patterns to come in the near future. Thank you for watching.